here, I'll take health insurance again. If I went uh, to the doctor, there were certain things I had to fill out. I had to have an insurance card. I had to give them my card. I had to do all these particular, well, we have an HR person here with us today, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Am I right, Mindy? You know what I'm talking about. You have to, you have to, you know, and that's what the HR person is there to do. They explain to you all the things that belong to you, yeah. all the things you have coming. And, but if you ever go and never find out, then you become ignorant of what benefit you have. And so some calamity or something could happen in your family or your life, and you don't even realize that I have this benefit that can help me through that situation. Well, it's like, that's like how the kingdom of God is. You know, many of us got, have gotten saved and accepted Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, but we don't know the benefits, so things happen in our lives. And trust me, calamity will come. Because bad things happen to good people. Because there is a devil. Amen. God is not sheltering you from everything. Some things he lets come into your life. Why? So that to, to, to build you up, to make you more than what you were. You know, if you're never challenged, you never can climb the ladder. Y'all hear what I'm saying? If you're never challenged, if you're never faced with adversity, you don't know then how to fight your way through or do whatever it takes to get through that adversity. And so God will many times allow things to come into your life, and you might think it's unfair, but God knows what he's doing, and he knows there is victory on the other side. He knows there's a light at the end of the, t at the, end of the tunnel. Yeah. The Bible says that he makes a way of escape no matter how bad things get for us. Amen? He makes a way of escape, and God is saying, okay, here's the escape door. Here's the, here's the way to get out. Now, what are you going to do? And then you have decisions you have to make, and you have to... Go either the kingdom way or you go the fleshly way that, you, you know, that you've always went and then it gets worse and worse and worse until you finally say, duh, wait a minute, I need, to get a I need to line up with what the word of God says and go that way. Amen? So, you know, you need to know how this stuff works so that you then can become a more effective kingdom citizen and you can show the world who you belong to and the power of God in your life because when calamity strikes them and they see it doesn't touch you then they're wondering what's going on why is it that you're surviving this why is it that you're you, you're coming through unscathed and we've got bumps and bruises and we're beaten down and we can't even get up amen a couple of things before we kind of get rolling we know that the kingdom is a real place it is a real place. It's not some, you know, ooh, place. You know, it's real. It's more real than this universe and the planet Earth. We know that it's a place where God rules and God reigns. We know that. Amen? If you don't know that, you better get a clue. The, other, the third point, we enter the kingdom when we accept the facts of the gospel and submit ourselves to the kingship of Jesus Christ. Once we come to Christ and accept him as our Lord and Savior, repenting of our sins, we've entered into the kingdom. That's the entrance. Jesus said, I'm the door. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. He's the way in to the kingdom. If you're not in Christ, you're not in the kingdom. All right? And the, and the fourth point is we are a colony. Us as the, you might say, the church here on earth, we are a colony of the kingdom of God living here on earth. Uh, the kingdom is in God's presence. It's in heaven, but we are the kingdom colony here. And with all the kingdom provision that God has for us at our disposal so that then we can establish the kingdom colony here. Jesus came out of the wilderness after being tempted of the devil in four, over 40 days and 40 nights. He came out of the wilderness, and this is what he preached. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That is the very thing we ought to be saying to people. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here. Jesus established the colony, and we continue it and keep it going. Amen. Until all of this universe is conquered by the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is what the Bible says over in uh, Philippians 3.20. And I'm reading, this is the amplified version. So I'm going to read it's, it in, in its entirety. We are citizens of the state, the commonwealth, the homeland which is in heaven, and from it also we earnestly and patiently await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as Savior. We are citizens of the state, the commonwealth, the homeland, which is in heaven. In other words, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible says. This is not something Pastor Dave is making up. This is what God has said. We are citizens of that kingdom. Well, if I'm a citizen there, then my citizenship here doesn't mean too much. Because that's a greater kingdom than this is. Amen? 
Another scripture, Ephesians 1, 3, this is also an amplified version. May blessing, praise, laudation, and eulogy be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Listen to this. Who has blessed us. Are you blessed? Yeah. Are you blessed? Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am blessed. Yeah. Now turn to your other neighbor and say, you are blessed. You are blessed. Who has blessed us in Christ. How are we blessed? in Jesus Christ with every spiritual, not some, not a few, but with every spiritual, given by the Holy Spirit, blessing in the heavenly realm. Let me ask you this question. Is the heavenly realm greater than the earthly realm? Is heaven greater than earth? So if heaven is greater than earth, the heavenly realm greater than the material universe, and the Bible says here that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Now let me stop right there. Is the heavenly realm, is it physical? No. It's spiritual. So that means everything in heaven is spiritual. Now, understand, when I say spiritual, I'm not talking about, you know, somebody says, oh, you know, I'm just so spiritual. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a place that's called the spirit world or the spiritual realm. It is a place that's also called heaven. And so you can substitute that word and say here, uh, he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing or heavenly blessing in the heavenly realm. Now, if heaven is greater than the earth, the heavenly realm is greater than the earthly realm, then that means everything in there is greater than everything I can have here. And if everything there is greater than everything that I can attain by my hands here, I'd much rather have the heavenly blessing than the earthly blessing. Wouldn't you agree? Does that make sense? So when the Bible says that he has blessed us in Christ with every spirit, spiritual blessing or heavenly blessing in the heavenly realm, I think I choose that over what men can give me or what men can do for me. Now, that doesn't mean God will not use men to bless you. He will use men to bless you, but you have to understand where the blessing comes from. It doesn't come from men. It comes from God because God used men to bless you. Let me give you an example. An example is when the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. And God told Moses, he says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Why? Why? Why do you want to harden Pharaoh's heart? He says, so the world can see that I'm God and he's not. I'm God and he's not. And so he hardened Pharaoh's heart. And, and for a while, Pharaoh became so hard that he, he really messed with the children of Israel. You can't use straw to make brick, but you have to keep the same quota. You got to find the straw yourself instead of us giving you the straw. And on and on and on. But finally, at the end, when the, the last plague came, what did Pharaoh say to him? Now, Pharaoh hated Moses and hated the children of Israel. But what did Pharaoh say to Moses and the children of Israel? Please, leave my land, have your freedom. We, we, we take off the shackles of slavery. And on top of that, God told him, he says, go and ask the Egyptians for all their goods. Uh, give, us, give us some recompense. Give us money for all that you've done. They, gave, they, plundered is, uh, 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 they plundered Egypt. They took all the gold and all the silver when they left out of there, out of Egypt. In other words, God used the Egyptians to bless them so that when they left, they didn't leave with nothing. They left with, left with all the riches of Egypt. Amen? So many times we look at people and say, oh, my boss doesn't like me. Oh, this one doesn't like me. It doesn't matter if they like me, love me, hate me. It doesn't matter because my blessings come from the heavenly realm. They come from God, not men. And he'll take that same supervisor, that same plant manager. He'll take that same CEO. He'll take that same COO. He'll take the same person who hates your guts. And he'll turn around, call you in the office, give you a raise, and don't even know why. And they'll tell you, I don't like you, but here's some more money in your paycheck. I've seen it. I've seen it. 
Why? Because your blessing doesn't come from men, it comes from God. We've been blessed with every, every, not some, not a few, but every spiritual blessing, every heavenly blessing that's in heavenly places. That means not only finance, that means healing, that means deliverance. Whatever I have a need of in my life, it is there in heaven, and I can receive it by the power of Almighty God, via the Holy Ghost, I can receive it in my life, and I can have that blessing. Now I know some of you are thinking, well pastor you don't know what I've been through. I've been through this, I've been through that. Everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a story. Your story is no worse or better than anybody else's. It doesn't matter what you've been through. What matters is have you appropriated the blessing that God has for you? Have you done what it takes to get the blessing? And I'm not talking about something you squander on yourself. That's not what I'm talking about. This is not about getting money and getting money and, and I can live a, a high and fancy life. That's not it. Because see, sometimes God will give you so that you can give. Uh-oh. Whoa-oh. Sometimes the Lord will put something in your hand. And you know, oh, you got a, a bonus check of ten thousand dollars. Then the Lord speaks to you and says, "Now I want you to put that in church." <laughs> but Lord, I, 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 I need this ten thousand dollars. But if you will obey the voice of the Lord. Because then the Lord is, what the Lord is telling you is, take that as a seed. Plant it as a seed. And watch what comes up. You think 10,000 is a lot. But if you plant what God tells you to plant, then you turn around and instead of 10,000, it'll be 100,000. It'll be a half a million dollars. Why? Because you plant it, you obey the voice of the Lord, you plant it in the soil, and God brings the increase. Y'all see what I'm saying here? But you have to believe what God says. Because what is faith? Faith is your belief system. And true, let me ask you a question. What do you believe? What do you believe? You know, a lot of times I'd be around preachers and, and you know, they talk about, you know, the people of faith. And I've, I've heard that statement a lot, the people of faith, faith people. And some of them group everybody in that in the sense of, you know, Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and, and Confucius and so forth and so on. Oh, we, you know, we're people of faith. But the truth of the matter is, every single human being is a person of faith because everybody believes something. Even if you say you don't believe, you believe in something, which is what I don't believe. Am I right? I mean, I know that doesn't necessarily sound logical, but you get what my point. So everybody is a person of faith, but it's, it's not about being a faith person. It is what do you believe? What do you believe? We say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Aha. Okay. Now, what you really believe is the way you act. What you really believe is, see, how many of you believe in the law of gravity? I believe in the law of gravity. Oh, trust me. I believe in it. I respect it. See, because I know. When I was a kid, I tested it out. And I found out that the law of gravity works it's real it shows no mercy <laughs> it doesn't have any degree of grace to it it just works we were kids we get up on the garage rooftops and play army man you know, does anybody ever do that play art you know 
So, now, I know you ladies didn't, but I know you guys played army man. Thank you, Mike. Army man. Oh, that's right. We played army man. And, and so, we, oh, yeah, we, we, climb up, uh, the, and we climb up on the roof of garages. And, you know, because, you know, you, gotta, you, gotta, you have, some, have to have some cover. So, you know, you can duck behind the peak and, you know, pow, 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 pow. And then, okay, you get shot. Well, you're on the rooftop. And so you get shot, you have to roll off the rooftop onto the ground below. And so that's what we would do. Now, I bless God, I never broke a bone, but some of my friends, <laughs> gravity is unforgiving. <laughs> broken arms. <laughs> yeah, a couple of wrists broken, you know. <laughs> but we found out that gravity was unforgiving. It's a law. And at that point, I had a firm belief in gravity because I knew that if I got up someplace high, and I stepped off into thin air without having a personal jet pack. <laughs> Every little boy dreamed of having a, a jet pack flying through the air. Well, we didn't, it, it didn't exist then, but we talked about it. But without a personal jet pack or any ropes, anything holding me up, I was going to fall. Am I right? Law of gravity. We understand it. We know that is real. We have faith in it. If an airplane that you're getting ready to get in looks rickety, holes in the wing, one of the engine's propellers is going pretty good, but the other one is kind of barely making it, what are you going to say when they say, welcome aboard? What are you going to say? I don't think so. I want a refund on my ticket or give me a different plane. Or you go in the jet and, and you, you're walking down the gangplank and you hear the pilot say as you get ready to go in the door, you know, you make, that, you, you, you make that right turn to go down the aisle. You hear the pilot say, I don't think one of the engines is working too well. <laughs> you might get on the plane and sit down for a minute, but you're listening to see if he's going to say, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, welcome passengers to flight 1352 with Delta, and uh, we've got a slight delay because we've got an engine that's not working well. But if he doesn't do that, you're asking, ding, 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 uh, is that engine okay? Why are you going to ask that? Because you know gravity is real. You know that if that plane is rickety, the engines aren't working correctly, something wrong, something will go wrong. If an airplane doesn't get the proper uh, uh, pressure under its wings so the law of lift that can cancel the law of gravity comes in operation, you know there's a problem. You don't want to fly in that airplane. Am I right? First flight I ever took. First flight I ever took in my entire life was in a two-seater Cessna trainer. Never been up in the air before in my life. I was a grown man. And the guy who took me up in the airplane was old. And I was concerned, I didn't voice that, but in my head I was a little concerned, will he make it? And when the airplane began to go up, I heard him do this. <coughs> and all, all that's going through my head is, is this guy going to die? I had never been up in a plane before, I don't know how to fly. And then he did it again. <coughs> And throughout the whole flight, he kept coughing. I couldn't enjoy the flight because I thought he was going to kill over any moment. Because my concern was, if something happens, I don't know how to fly the plane, guess what's going to happen? It's going to go down and we're all going to die because of the law of gravity. You say, you spend a lot of time talking about gravity. Well, because I'm trying to get you to understand we all have faith, we all believe something. We all believe something. Every single one of us has faith. But what do you believe? What do you have faith in? Who do you have faith in? We as Christians have our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, Lord of lords. The government is on his shoulders. That's who we have our faith in. But if I have faith in something like the law of gravity, then guess what? I respect it. And I don't do anything foolish to violate it. So my question to you is, when you say, I have faith in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, he's my Lord and Savior, I have faith in God, you answer me this question. Well, how many times have you violated? I've 
going to meddling, haven't I? Do I step back or keep going forward? I think I'll keep going forward. <laughs> I've gone, yeah, hey, I, 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 you've got to understand and you've got to say to yourself, am I violating what I say I believe? Because if I'm constantly violating what I say I believe, then re- do I really believe what I say? Or am I just speak, just, just talking? Am I just flapping my gums? Oh, oh yeah, Pastor. I believe in Jesus. Oh yeah. Then why do you keep violating that which you say you believe? I've had some people tell me, oh, it's just so hard to be saved. I've not found it hard to be saved. Well, that's because you're a pastor. You think because I was a, God anointed me to be pastor, he gave me special power? <laughs> no. We're all human beings, flesh and blood. Saved, but in a sinful body. And every single one of us have passions of the flesh. Now we have a choice to make. What do I do? Do I obey the king? Or do I obey the flesh? Do I live with the king and, 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 and have faith in him and do what he declares? Or do I say I have faith in the king but yet do what my flesh declares? What do I do? How many of you know that you, you are a triune being? We all know that the, the, the God is a triune being, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, right? The Trinity. But how many of you know that being made in his image is not two arms, two legs, a nose, and two ears, and two eyes? But being made in his image is being made like him as a triune or being of trinity. You have three parts to yourself. Body, soul, spirit. Now when you got saved, you became a born again Christian, right? You must be born again, Jesus told Nicodemus. You must be born again. And so old things passed away, the old spirit was eh, annihilated, and you've got a brand new spirit, a new spirit that is now in line with God. Hallelujah. That's awesome. But you still got, you still have your body and your soul. So now how do I work all this together? Well, the Bible says that I have to be renewed by the washing of the water of the word. So my soul, my mind, you might say, has to be renewed. I have to, I have to begin to get into what God has said to get that inside of myself. I got a new spirit, but that new spirit is, is now a minority between the body and the soul. Make sense? So I might have a new spirit, but my flesh still might be reigning supreme. It still might be leading the way. So I have to then begin to get a majority going on in my, in my life. So I have to, that's why the Bible says study, 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 study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why does God tell you to study? I got a brand new spirit. I automatically belong to God. Why do I need to study? So that you can get his word, his edicts, his language, his voice into your mind and your heart, your spirit. And that begins to be transformed. And that's the transformation process because we're being transformed. And it's a process. It doesn't, you, hey, you got saved, boom, in a twinkling of an eye. But now you need to be transformed. So now you have to get the word, the word into your inside of you, down into that new spirit. You have to get this word, and so now you have something that you can stand on when situations come about. You have something you can say, well, wait a minute. No, no, I'm not going uh, uh, to go according to the flesh because the flesh would tell me, because you jumped in my face, my flesh would tell me to hit you in your eye. But I have a new direction based on the word of God. And what the Bible says, because I've been transformed, I've studied the word, studying to show myself approved unto who? God. I'm a workman. And because I've got the word, I'm not ashamed. And I know how to now rightly divide. If you can rightly divide, that means you can wrongly divide. 
the word of truth. Because the word of God is truth, not some relative truth. It is the truth. There's no other truth except the word of God. Jesus said, I am the truth. And Jesus is also called what? The word. So now as I get his word inside of me, I'm being transformed. So now my new spirit, are you learning something here? Now my new spirit has a partner, has a buddy. And that is my transformed soul, transformed mind. And so now my thinking is right. Whereas before my thinking was wrong. See, before in my life, if you jumped up in my face and cussed me out, well, guess what? You got a beating coming. Now, you jump up in my face and cuss me out. It may take me a minute. but I'm going to bless you. Not bless you for cussing me out, but I'm going to speak a blessing over you because by speaking a blessing over you, the Bible says he heaped coals of fire upon your head. I'm going to speak a blessing because I want to see you change rather than get a beat down. <laughs> like I said, I'm going to be honest. It might take a, a minute. I might have to step back, close my eyes, and come to myself, but I'm not going to give you a beat down. I'm a little too old in the tooth to get beat downs now anyway. <laughs> but you understand my point. Why? Because now I've got a whole different way of how to do things, not just because I've got a brand new spirit, I'm saved, but also because I've been transformed in how I think. And so the transformation in how I think shows, the result is my actions now show the new way that I'm thinking which is according to the word of God and I bless instead of curse. I pray for you instead of stay angry with you and put my foot on your neck. I love you. Now let me say, a, let me take a sidetrack here. Love is not being stupid. Love is not stupidity. Love is not, you know, oh, is it, you know, I've seen this too many times. A wife has been mistreated by her husband. And you say, why do you take that? And every single time what I've heard is, because I love him. Then I try and explain to them that's not love. That's not love. Oh, but I love him. That's but no, 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 no. That's not love. That's not love. Jesus loves us, gave himself for us. A man who loves his wife gives himself for her. Hello, guys. Come on, man. Can I have all the men say, amen, pastor? Amen. Can I have all the men say, preach it, brother? Preach it, brother. Oh, come on. That's not, you got to say it with conviction. Preach it, brother. Preach it, brother. Come on, stand up, man, and say, preach it, brother. Preach it, brother. <laughs> One more time. Preach it, brother. Preach it, brother. All right. <laughs> Ladies, say amen. amen. Come on, ladies. Amen. Amen, amen pastor. Amen. <laughs> Woo, I love it. <laughs> now, see, the lady's feeling empowered now. Y'all going to go home and say, see, you heard what pastor said. You better not mistreat me. And he ought not mistreat you. But the Bible also says, 
Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. So don't go home saying, you can't mistreat me, so take out that garbage. <laughs> wash those dishes. Do that laundry. Hi, and I'm going to sit here and watch the stories and eat some bonbons. <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know if that's true. I have no idea. <laughs> huh? <laughs> that's not, no, 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 no. So, so I've heard women say that because I love him. But that's not love. Because this is what love is. A wife submits herself to her own husband as unto the Lord. A husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And when both, when each one is doing what they should do, as the Bible says over in that chapter of Ephesians, then they will have a happy marriage. Because she's going to say, honey, I love you and I'm willing to go with you to the ends of the earth. And he's going to say, honey, no matter what happens, I'm there for you. I'll take a bullet for you. I'll stand in front of you. It does not matter what comes my way. They won't get to you before they get to me. That's what a real man does. You're right. That's what a real man does. Where was I at? <laughs> Lost my train of thought. <laughs> but that's, but, and, and so we have to remember, you know, Christ loves us. God loves us. But when that great white throne judgment comes, all those who have rejected him are going to go to the pit of hell and hell is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. That's just the reality. Does that God love them any less? No, he still loves them, but he understands. See, God understands something that we don't understand. He's not emotional with his love. His love toward us is such that he died on the cross for us to save us. But if you reject that, then he rejects you. I'm reminded of the prodigal son. Do I have time? Yep, I'm reminded of the prodigal son. Prodigal, every, every pastor in the world has preached about the prodigal son. We all know the story of the prodigal son. We know what happened. The boy came to his father and said, Daddy, I don't want to live here no more. I don't want these shackles of being on this farm with you anymore. And my brother, let me go. <laughs> I'm kind of embellished a little bit. but <laughs> Give me my money and my inheritance. Now, see, if I was his father, I would have said, you walk out that door, you get nothing. <laughs> That's me. But his father said, okay, son, gave him his portion of the inheritance and sent him on his way. Yes. Now, did the father love his son? Yes. Can I remind you of something about that story? He never chased after him. He didn't run down the road saying, son, come back. The boy got used up everything he had, got a good Jewish boy, now he's out there feeding pigs. What does he say to himself? When he came to himself, he said, I can go back to my father's house, not as a son, he said, but as a servant. Because the servants in my father's house eat better and live better than I'm living out here right now. So I, I, I'll, I'll let my father know I've sinned against God and I've sinned against him. And if he would just take me back as a slave, just take me back as a slave, I would be so appreciative. But when the father saw the son coming down the road, coming back, knowing that he had come to himself, he ran and met him, put a ring on his finger, a robe around his, back, uh, around his uh, shoulders, and had a feast because his son, his son now had returned. Not because that's just my flesh and blood, but the one who I raised who knew better. See, the one who left didn't know better. He was an idiot. He was a knucklehead. And you have to be able to say, bye. I love you, but I'm not going to enable you. You can go. I'm not saying that's easy. I'm sure it wasn't easy for that father. 
But he loved him enough. Uh-oh, here we go. He loved him enough to say, you go out there, bang your head up against the wall, you get beat down, you lose everything you have, go for it. Go for it. Be your own man. Be your, yeah, you don't want to be on this farm, milking cows, plowing a field. Nah, there's a whole bright light, big city out there. Go for it. And he cut him loose. See, our idea of love is we can't cut him loose. Uh-oh. We can't cut him loose. And so because we can't cut him loose, we ruin him. Because we're there enabling. Oh, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, no. it's okay. It's okay. Everything's okay. No, it's not okay. It wasn't okay for him to take his portion. It wasn't okay for him to go and spend it on riotous living. It wasn't okay for him to do all the things. That was not okay. And his father was not going to rubber stamp that. In the church, in our homes, everywhere, we think, that's, we think love is, it's okay. No, it's not okay. God says it's not okay. And, we, and when people get before the right throne judgment, I don't care what some people say, oh, God loves everybody because he loves us so he's not going to let anybody go to hell. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong answer. What God is saying is very simply, I love you. I've given you a way out. Take the way out. I want every single one of you to take the way out. But if you choose not to, nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. I started out talking about we're three people, body, soul, spirit. My spirit has been changed by the blood of the lamb. Instantly, I've been saved. Now my mind, my, my, my soul is being transformed by the power of the word of God. Now, two out of three makes a majority. So when the flesh rises up, and this is what Paul says about his flesh. He says, I get under my flesh and pull it into subjection. Anybody here ever wrestle? I never was a wrestler, but I understand one, one, I understand something about wrestling. I used to watch, you know, WWE, WWF, whatever it was at the time, and, you know, watch, you know, and then before that, I watched Big Time Wrestling with Bobo Brazil and Leaping Larry Shane, and I know that's beyond some of you have. Who are these guys? Man, he's, the, I, Rocky Johnson, The Rock's father. I, I watched those guys. And one of the things a wrestler wants to do is incapacitate his opponent. And the way he incapacitates his opponent is he does not allow him to get any leverage. As long as a wrestler can get his hands on the ground, he can use that as leverage to get out of a hole. If he gets his feet on the ground, he can use that as leverage to get out of a hole. So what they want to do is tie up his hands, tie up his feet, keep him up, you know, up, up, up in the air so that he has no leverage and he's then, he has to submit. There was a type of, in the, in the uh, I don't know if it was MMA, U, U, UFC, or whatever, but they, uh, th there was a family, the Gracies. You know what I'm talking about. You know, f f yeah, UFC, the Gracies. And they had a form of judo where they wrestled and fought off their back. And they, and they pinned their opponents while they were on their back because they would incapacitate their opponent with a, a, a series of holes holding their legs and feet and arms and so forth and then they are on their back but the guy and then they have a, an arm twisted up so all of a sudden it's going to get broke if he doesn't submit and he's you know he's just waving there ah, I submit I submit I submit and they won tons of fights because of that form of fighting Paul says I get under my body and pull it into subjection what he's saying is I don't give my body any leverage I don't give it any leverage. I incapacitate my flesh so it cannot do what it wants to do. It cannot speak to me. It cannot do anything but tap out. And then I don't let go because I still got to live, so I just keep holding on to it. And I hold on to it and keep it incapacitated until the day I die and that flesh goes into the ground, but my spirit and my soul go on to be with Jesus. I've taken that which is against me and tied it up. That's what, that's, that's, what, that's what this is all about, saints. What, who do you believe? Do you believe God and let that word transform 
that second part of you, that soul, that mind? Or do you believe your flesh? Hangs in the balance. You can't believe Jesus one day and your flesh the next. It's got to be every day, all day, all the time. Have you been blessed so far? All right, next week we'll continue on.